Hey guys, it's Miss Vincent. Today we're going to talk about market failures and when the government should step in in case a market becomes inefficient or doesn't provide the right goods for people. Now the definition of a market failure is basically whenever a market that's left to its own devices does not provide the allocatively or socially optimal output level that society wants. And so sometimes the government has to get involved. First, let's talk about the difference between private goods and public goods. Most of the goods that we have been talking about being exchanged in the product market are called private goods. The criteria for a private good is that it has to be a rival good and it has to be an exclusive good. A rival good is one in which if somebody else consumes that, that prevents you from being able to consume that. So for instance, let's say that somebody brings cupcakes to class, but whenever somebody eats a cupcake, that's one less cupcake for you. So whenever they consume that item, that prevents you from being able to consume that item as well. An excludable good is one that you can deny to people if they're not willing to pay a price for it. So for instance, if you really wanna go see a movie, well, unless you pay the price for a ticket, then you're not gonna get into the theater. So that is an excludable good. Certain groups of people can be excluded from consuming that good or service if they can't pay the price. Now, there are some goods that are non-rival and non-excludable, and those are called public goods. Those are things like police protection, public education, protection by the military service. If you think about public education, that is non-rival. Adding another student to a classroom does not prevent all of the other students from learning the content. It can be shared by many people. So one person's consumption does not interfere with another person's consumption of that good or service. So that's non-rival. Non-excludable means that you can't deny someone this good or service even if they don't pay for it. So for instance, when we talk about military protection, you can't go to somebody and say, well, we're not gonna protect you because you didn't pay your taxes. In these non-excludable goods, people who maybe haven't even paid taxes, people who haven't even participated in trying to raise money for that good or service can still benefit from that good or service. So you can't exclude people from enjoying that good or service just because they didn't pay or just because they didn't help participate in raising money. The problem with public goods is how do you raise the money to pay for these things? You know, we have something called the free rider problem. If people don't have to pay for something to reap the benefits of it, then usually people don't pay for it. Well, this is an instance of market failure. Private markets do not provide these types of goods because it's not profitable. And so this is where the government should step in and provide these public goods because they have the means of raising money. They can raise money from citizens through taxes and that tax money can go to help pay for these things that really benefit everyone. So one way that the government can step in and help out in a time of market failure is by providing goods that private markets won't sell. Now let's talk about something called externalities. An externality is when the action of someone or some company has an unintended consequence on a third party, so kind of an unintended consequence on an innocent bystander. There can be negative and positive externalities. A negative externality is when somebody does something and it has an unintended harmful effect on a third party. A positive externality is when somebody does something and it has an unintended beneficial effect on someone. Let me give you an example of each. First, let's start with negative externalities. An example of a negative externality would be like pollution. 
We know that whenever companies set up shop or set up their factory along a river, sometimes when they use that water, they may not clean it before they dump it back into the river after they've used it. And so that pollution can have a bad consequence, not only on the environment and everybody that uses that water for enjoyment, but also it could hurt any other factories that are downstream that need to use that water in their production process. So really, the government needs to step in and deal with this situation. Let's take a look at a negative externality on a graph. Now, if we're talking about a market, remember that we have a downward sloping demand curve, which represents the marginal social benefit. So this downward sloping demand curve may be the marginal social benefit that people receive whenever they buy this company's product. And then we also have the supply curve is how much money the company needs to make before they'll supply certain amounts. Remember your supply curve can also be your marginal cost. In this case, it would be your marginal private cost. How much this company, this private company is spending to produce its output. But that doesn't really capture the entire cost that's happening in this scenario because it's not just the company that's having to deal with the cost of this production. It's the environment and it's everybody that lives around there that has to deal with the spillover costs. They have to deal with these negative unintended consequences. So actually on our graph, what we're gonna draw is the marginal social cost curve, which is on top of the marginal private cost curve. So why is there a marginal social cost and a marginal private cost? Well, again, the marginal private cost is just how much money this company is spending to produce its product. But there is a social cost happening as well. Some people are having to deal with the consequences of this production. And so really, that makes the cost of this company producing its product higher than just what they're paying. Look at how much is being produced at equilibrium in this market, where the marginal social benefit hits the marginal private cost. That's how much stuff is being produced just by this firm normal amount. So we have our Q1, we have our output level from this firm, and we have the price level from this firm, P1. But we don't really want that many things produced, all right? Because when they produce that many things, then we're having to deal with all of this extra pollution. As a society, we would rather have them produce less and just clean up their act. Because look at the socially optimal output level. The socially optimal output level, the amount of stuff that society would like to see this company produce, is actually where the marginal social benefit doesn't hit the marginal private cost, it's where it hits the marginal social cost, the actual cost that society is paying for this company's production. And so when we look at where the marginal social benefit hits the marginal social cost, you can see that that is a lower output level. So society would really like to see this company make less output. Now, how can we get this company to produce less? Well, if the government comes along and puts a per unit tax on this company, that's gonna shift the marginal private cost curve, their individual supply curve, up by the amount of the tax. Now, if this tax can shift their supply curve up and make it more in line with the marginal social cost, then that's gonna move their production level closer to the socially optimal output level. And also, let me point out the dead weight loss on this graph. It's still a beak, but it's a reverse beak. The dead weight loss on this graph is all of the units that are being produced that society doesn't want and the extra costs that they're having to deal with from those extra units. So the beak or the dead weight loss on a negative externality graph is going to be a triangle that is between the marginal private cost and the marginal social cost curves and spans those units of output that society doesn't want produced, those units of output that are too many. 
Now let's talk about a positive externality. Now remember, a positive externality is when somebody is doing something and it has an unintended beneficial consequence on a third party. So this may be like when people go to get flu shots, all right? Now when you get a flu shot, not only does that you know benefit you and hopefully will protect you against getting the flu in the winter months, but if a lot of people get flu shots, then hopefully that's going to prevent many people from getting the flu and will actually help stop the spread of flu in the community and in the area. So when you get a flu shot, not only does that have a beneficial effect for you, that's your marginal private benefit, but it also has a marginal social benefit, an additional benefit to society because it's helping to stop the spread of flu in general to the area. Instead of society wanting less stuff, with a positive externality, we actually want more of this positive stuff. And so here's what the graph looks like for a positive externality. We have a supply curve, which is the marginal social cost curve. And then we have two demand curves this time. So instead of two supply curves, like we have with negative externality, we have two demand curves. Why do we have two demand curves? Well, we have your normal regular demand curve, which is the marginal private benefit that customers receive. Like if I pay for a flu shot, then I get the benefit of my body being protected. That's my marginal private benefit. But it doesn't just benefit me, it actually has benefits to the entire society. So there's another demand curve that represents the marginal social benefit. And so notice that with positive externalities, society actually enjoys the benefits of my actions and that goes beyond just the private benefit that I enjoy from getting this flu shot. So I'm not just keeping myself healthy, I'm helping to sort of keep the community healthy as well and stop the spread of germs. Now, whenever we have a positive externality, there is not enough stuff being produced. Check out how much stuff is being produced. Look where your marginal private benefit is hitting your marginal social cost. All right, where those two intersect, that's gonna be Q1. But is that how much stuff society wants to see produced? Mm-mm. Socially optimal output level is always where the marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost. Well, since the marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal private benefit, society would actually like to see a greater output of these things produced. So how can we increase the quantity to the socially optimal output level? Well, instead of taxing something, sometimes the government will step in and offer subsidies for things. Now remember, a subsidy is always a good thing. A subsidy is always like whenever the government helps to pay for something which reduces the cost, like the government subsidizes school lunches. That's why kids don't have to pay a lot for lunch at school because the government really wants to encourage kids to eat some food, right? So. The government will step in and offer subsidies and try to make the prices lower and try to make the prices cheaper so that that will entice people to create and consume larger quantities of this item. So if the government subsidizes flu shots and makes it where basically all you have to do is just go and get a shot, it's free, it's been subsidized by the government, then that would increase the demand for flu shots. So notice that you're doing your demand curve increases, then that moves your marginal private benefit more in line with your marginal social benefit, and that gets us closer to the socially optimal output level. Because even in positive externality, there's a dead weight loss. Remember, dead weight loss is always a beak, and in this case, the beak is that space between the marginal private benefit and the marginal social benefit. That's all the extra benefit that society wants to get, and they want to get that extra benefit on these additional units of output. So whenever these additional units of output are made, we could actually increase our surplus and increase how much we want by that amount. But until those items are made, we're missing out on the enjoyment and the benefit we would have gotten from those quantities. So these are examples of when the market left to its own devices 
would not produce the socially optimal output level. There's either too much stuff if it's a negative externality or not enough stuff if it's a positive externality. And so the government can step in and either through taxes or subsidies can help get us closer to that socially optimal output level. Now we'll work with this a little bit later, but as soon as you practice it just a couple times, I know it's gonna click and make sense, especially with all the work you've done so far. So until then, see you next time.